Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We are here for the second map between Corvette and Chiefs, our first semi final today. Chiefs walked away victorious on cash, 16 13 in an L binding finish. Yep. Expectations, Pete? Map two? It's going to be a, uh, a pretty tough ask for uh, Corvette here if they don't start on CT. For me, if they start on CT and they win this knife, they can really, uh, really do some damage. But Chiefs. And I know that their preparation level is really good. I think that coming into this tournament, they're easily the most prepared team yep. for this tournament. And I think that because of that, they'll have a really, really good understanding of what lost them a lot of rounds yesterday against uh, their opponent in Trident, yep. in which they lost this train game. So for me, that's advantage uh, Chiefs. Not to say that, obviously, we can't rule Corvette out of any map based on pure skill because they're right there with them. However, I think that if Chiefs start on the CT side, in particular, it might be a tough ask here for Corvette. So I do hope that they start CT so we can get an absolute cracker here. I just hope Gratisfaction's allowed to warp. Well, in the first six or seven rounds. That'd be nice. So, you know, those first few gun rounds, are probably yep. the most important. We saw yep. how well Corvette played when they actually had momentum in the last map. Yep. There were spurts. Obviously, they started off slow, didn't finish well either. But during the middle portion of that game, they yep. actually accumulated about 10 out of 13 or 14 rounds at one point. So yep. I hope for them that they can start out on the right foot and potentially if they can be on the CT side. That lends itself to what you were saying. It, it's generally, in at least in the Australian meta, considered to be the easier of the two sides. Yep. Obviously, we've seen a, sh a shift in that sort of mentality on the global scale, but at least in Australia, I think it's still fair to say it's CD sided, and I, I this think is a brilliant vantage point. It is, and I, and I think more than the like the global scale of the map, it's the standard scale. So, the really, really good teams are finding ways to abuse the T-side advantage on this map with very precise and well-timed executes. However, if you don't have that level of, I guess, strategy and skill, it is more suited to a CT side. So, at the very, very highest level, I think it's, it can be a T-Slider map as proven at MLG uh, Columbus, where I think the map was played five times and over 60% of the rounds went to the terrace at that tournament, which is a pretty impressive turnaround for train. However, um, in, in this particular game, I do favour the CT side and it will go the way of Chiefs. Um, so, I ho I'm hoping for Corvette that they do have something in the tank here to, uh, to bust out. I'll let you keep talking for a set, Peter, so I want to make sure our... Crosshair is good for the viewers at home. So maybe in terms of uh, what core or Chiefs need to do to continue on their merry way? Yeah, Chiefs just need to make sure that um, they're hitting shots, uh, basically. They they really started strong with their strategy and their aim. And as this pistol round starts off, you can see they're just breaking off into a pretty standard formation. And uh, the T's already busting out mid, so this is going to progress straight onto A here. And it's going to be Mungo who takes the first pick of the action, but uh, nothing will come of it now. Chris O'Wow getting smacked there by Alistair Byrne. We'll pick up one. Destiny also on, but uh, it's going to be Corvade moving their way into the bomb side. Destiny able to pick up another one, so such a tense situation. He's going to get a TK onto Destiny. Dexter, he's absolutely spammed through the smoke at a uh, invisible opponent, and now it's going to be a two versus one. He does pick up the first one versus one. Such a huge round in the context for Gratis Faction. He does have the bomb in hand, and he's circling the bomb train. He does, he will definitely hear Destiny. Destiny, on the other hand, doesn't have any idea where Gratis Faction is. He does spot him out now, though. A very tense outcome looming here for both players now. Gratis Faction moving off that bomb train, and Destiny deciding to throw them off. The fake grenade, he does pick out to the left. Sack Gratis Faction in a one versus one. Brilliant aim there from Destiny. Despite the TK, he's got he's actually got four kills in that round. Three enemies and a teammate. And he has been the difference yesterday and today between winning and losing for Chiefs. He's playing at a star level. He's so confident when he's running around. Even in that one versus one, he wanted to find Gratis Faction. He wanted to take that aim jewel. And what a crisp headshot to finish it off. Actually dropped a decoy there just so that create even more doubt in the mind of Gratis Faction as to where he was. But he didn't even need it. I think he'd taken that frag before that decoy even had any effect but nonetheless Chiefs Destiny carrying them head and shoulder at the moment through this map at the moment he has got them off to a strong start they're now in a position where they will buy those SMGs even a shotgun from Mungo which I do like but Corvidae they've bought some pistols armor moving out at the moment haven't yet found a frag it's ultimately been Chiefs that have done that Destiny continuing on his merry way gets one unfortunately for Mungo that shotgun not putting any effect on this round and Chiefs just cleaning the shop here Destiny is just absolutely hammering them. He's been the 100% the difference. Him and the clutch play of Chris around certain points in that game. But Destiny is putting forward a fantastic performance here and uh, really putting his uh, name forward. If he continues throughout this like this all day, he's uh, making a very strong case for MVP at the moment. He's playing at a such a fantastic level that it's it's difficult to, to argue any other way. But Corvade still managed to get 13 rounds last map and obviously they took care of business in that eco round and now Corvade will not invest at all. Not a, well, one flash, I think, on Gratis, uh, which is odd for me because anyone else but Gratis should be buying that uh, flash. But yep. 
the grenades rain down and it'll just be a simple B push here, inside push, and it will come in here. Dexter picks up one, but uh, it'll just be all she right there for for Corvidae. Nothing really going on. What I want to point out as well, so I think it's fair to say train out of every map in the map pool, it's considered the easiest from a terrorist perspective to get a bomb plant down. Yep. Not to win terrorist rounds, but to get a bomb plant. We've already seen that so far, Corvidae haven't managed to do that. They've been eliminated three times in a row. I guess due to the nature of the map, the effect that Smokes can have in shutting off those lanes, that's why it's perceived to be that way, but at the moment, Chief's ruling the shop. Yeah, they've uh, won the pistol and they're two concurrent anti-eco, so that's fine. And now Dexter will grab that AWP and try and spot out towards Midcon. But uh, interestingly enough, Corbett have found their way out mid to the left cutout and they'll, they'll fight pretty closely there. Mungo able to pick one up. No, he doesn't, but the trade comes in from Dexter as he gets the crosshair to nail uh, Alistair there and he'll drop off the train onto Inns, but uh, Urkast and Steve have also got some kills going their way and now it is a two versus two once again. Burn Rook and uh, Dexter there. Burn, are you okay? And Gratisfaction Steeds left in the server. Well, down to a two versus two. Like you said, Grat's still alive with that AWP. Hasn't taken a point of damage as well, so he'll be instrumental in Corvidae to win this round. And he's ultimately the only man who can do it at this point. Is it a one versus two? Dexter, the movement up and down that green train. He's managed to catch a few this round. Three made it. Looking for a fourth. Grat there blind. It still has plenty of time to work with, and the bomb is still in a safe position for him to cover. So no need to panic just yet. We did say that a map such as Train allows players to really exploit the long distance when they do have that sniper rifle. And you see him picking up that orb. I'm not sure whether Dexter would have spotted him there. And I think at the moment, Gratch is more concerned about where's Burn. He knows that Dexter is down towards that Vines alley. And you can see Dexter actually doing quite aggressive because with the time that's passed, he himself is not sure where the terrorist is. I don't like this play at all from Chiefs. Look at the space between those two dots. It's given Gratisfaction a chance at two very distinct one versus one situations here, which is not what you want from a Chief's perspective at all. And he's going to get that bomb down and get into a situation where he's going to spawn out one CT. I think, I don't know if he actually saw him there, but it looks as though he spotted out some form of either name tag or, or situation. He's got an AK in hand. He's dropped that AWP. He's on full health and in a great position to win this one. Dex has no idea. He's on the left to the cutout and uh, unfortunately for Gratisfaction, he's given himself away, but he's still got a fantastic opportunity to win this one. Dexter picks out. He'll actually pick up the quad kill for the round. He gets a bunch of orb kills and then two, or actually three spectacular CZ kills to pause that one off. And it Chiefs, you know, hang on by the, uh, the scrape, the scrape of the... Uh, Scrape of the neck. Well, we didn't like the way they played that 2v1, to be perfectly honest. Not they, at they all. Not at all. In such a fashion, they had one at A, Dexter pushing very aggressively down Vines, but they also had one member burn fall back towards the B site to try and lock it down. But like you said, they created the one versus one jewels. Ultimately, they did a good job of pincering Gratisfaction after that bomb had been planted. Once Dexter got wind of where Grat was playing from in that cutout, it allowed them to focus their forces in that one place. But at the moment, Corvidae, not off to that good start that we said that they really needed to have a fighting chance in this map, we thought. They're going to have to make do at the moment with five AKs. Already Alistair has taken some damage, but you can see the change of pace. Perhaps a more default structure coming in this round with, I guess, two at Vines initially, but now one member in the form of Grat falling back towards Teton, but trying to just perhaps gain control of map territory, make sure that CTs aren't overly aggressive, which we've already seen that they have a proclivity to do, particularly yep. in the previous map. Definitely. Dexter here with that scope up the low ramp, and he's going to spot out Urkast as he just probably wanders across here at this point. And, oh, he does nail him. He's down to 19 HP, I believe, so 81 damage dealt out there via that uh, AWP that was tagged through the corner of the wall. But nevertheless, uh, they'll all remain intact in play here. All 10 players still remaining, and it looks as though the, uh, the strat here from Corvidae is going to be to drop down and try and hit this outside bomb fight via the SL and the T-Connector. So just a matter of time here, Nick, before these smokes and flashes rain out and then they actually execute on the bomb site. Yeah, and I think, like you said, it's only a matter of seconds. In fact, not even time, because Alistair just priming that flash grenade. In the end, just waited that timing instant. But I'm not convinced it's actually an outside attack yet, Pete. There's still members in ground halls, but nonetheless, like, stand corrected. They are funneling their way out of SL. Now, Gratisfaction has found one, but Mungo and Chriso just shutting down this attack. Chriso, a nice trip there to really set up his team's chances this round. And the Iceman showing that he can do it at all points in the round, not just in the clutch, but Corvidae. We said that they were taking so long, Pete, to set up that A execute, but in the end, it still looked disjointed. There were members in the B round halls as that attack was coming in. Now, I'm not sure how that can happen. In the end, it almost seemed as though it was only an SL point at which they attacked ultimately anyway. Yeah, it's, uh, it was a weird hit, and that really uh, doesn't bode well for Corvidae because you'd think if they had a, uh, a top-tier execute available to them, that that was certainly the round to put it to fruition uh, with no AWP in play. No real need to uh, go slow and steady uh, after the, they had all the options available to them in terms of a set execute, so worrisome signs, but uh, they will keep competing and competing hard all match long. Yeah, Steve's going for the boost, but Destiny, are we surprised to see him charging Teton? He picks up one, spots the second, 
hasn't yet converted, but doesn't quite have the time to reload. So that, I guess, expensive use of, or generous use of ammo early on, not working out for him ultimately, but Tristo does try in. But what I will suggest, Pete, looking back at yesterday, when Chiefs did lose to Trident on this map, it was Trident's ability on the terrorist side to exploit the B-bomb side. Break in particular was able to walk out high ramp and just really just have his own way, cause that CT rotation and cause chaos, I'd say, inside that site. But at the moment, Corvide, they've only really attacked one bomb site, apart from one single eco rush. Yep, and uh, that's, this is sort of why I was very uh, skeptical of Corvide being able to put together T side rounds on train because it would have actually been better for Corvide. I mean, that's obvious. If, if if Chiefs beat Trident, Corvide wouldn't even have to have played them. So it doesn't really matter yes. in that sense. What I mean to say is, because Trident beat Chiefs, they have now gone away and had a really hard look at their train and what went wrong, and that's actually not very beneficial at all for Corvide, because if any issues existed, they probably got fixed, and <laughs> now uh, Corvide have to deal with a revamped train uh, from uh, the Chiefs' perspective. So that's a little bit difficult, but at the moment you can see <laughs> hyper-aggression coming out here from Mungo Burn and a, uh, a third Chiefs player there right next to him, and it's not going to be expected there. Burn taking down Inns and they'll both fall out. I think that's Dexter with that. No, Dexter's outside with the orb, so I think it will be Destiny, in, in fact, one of the D players inside. And Dexter's spotted out a terrorist making his way out the T-Con into the middle of the train yard. And uh, he has been spotted, and Alistair will get the kill, in fact, onto Dexter, so brilliant work there, but the ever-dangerous Chris Awao is left in the cutout section, and he's going to have an absolute field day by the looks of things here. Gets the first and spots out another one. Can he get the second? He sprays the length of the map. He can't connect. Stage is so low, but look at Destiny making plays on this bomb train. He'll have to be careful, though, because there is one coming behind him, but he's not connected at all. Destiny, oh, no. Can he get the kill? He ends up finding it. And uh, a roar goes out from the crowd, but Nick, Urkast, two versus one. That's right, he did get that first frag in Brandhalls, let's not forget, but at the moment, the AWP is almost a disadvantage in the sense that both CTs are quite low, and one hit kill, it almost nullifies the CTHP, and as it is, Burn gets that final frag, Urkast goes down 7-0, the Chiefs cries ring out, but I might just point out that comical frag in Brandhalls to start the round, I think Urkast was actually holding above SL in Whitehalls, watching yep. towards the high ramp, but I think as Alistair pushed through, or uh, I, I do apologize, one of the Chiefs members pushed through, he actually jumped up, which meant that Urkast's spot towards Hyrub actually caught vision of him. So it was unfortunately the spacebar was his downfall, but Chiefs, that's about the only thing that hasn't gone right for him. Correct, and Destiny picking up possibly the worst and most important frag of the game <laughs> there, able to uh, close out that round because he himself will not be particularly impressed with that, given his level of play so far. But the only reason in which he actually had that opportunity to get that frag, I think his teammate in the form of Gratisfaction missed an open AWP shot onto the back of Destiny. Yep. Destiny actually, we saw him go around the front of the bomb train, had the cover of the smoke initially, but it dissipated as he moved his way around the train, and Gratisfaction had an open shot, missed it, Destiny got a frag eventually. And uh, Corvide opting for the tack pause here. Yeah. And uh, that obviously backfired for me quite heavily yesterday. I don't even know what you're doing there. Yeah. What, what? Tack pause coming out here for Corvide. All right. And uh, they've historically used those tack pauses really, really well. So even last map. Even last map. But uh, obviously yesterday against Legacy, that was a very fruitful tack pause. And now last map, they came back and looked like a different team coming through uh, that one as well. So hopefully they'll be able to sort uh, what's going what's going wrong and make some changes, but I'm actually not certain that they know what's going wrong, which is, a, uh, which is a lot of the problem, because they've really done nothing to try and figure out what Chiefs are doing. They've just lost their lives repeatedly. There's two things they need to do in this instance. We booked the mid play on Cache last time. Let's book it right now. There's two things they need to do. They need to get map territory. I want them to play slow. I want them to take control of Brown Horse. That's so important on a T-side default. So many times, particularly with up-and-coming teams, when we watch them play, we cast so much CS these days. We see teams playing their inside member just above the, the inside stairs not committing to Brown Horse. They need yeah. to take that and force Chiefs to play two members in that B-bomb site. That's the first thing they need to do. The second thing they need to do is actually use that AWP and take it to different parts of the map initially on their default. I don't just want to see Gratis Faction holding in the White Horse as we've seen him do. I want him to take it Vines early. I want him to take it Tcon. I want him to take it inside. They need to move it around the map and keep Chiefs guessing. They certainly do and uh, hopefully that they... They talked through it in some similar fashion, but at the moment they're just going to eco, which I'm not a huge fan of taking tack balls before an eco, but it doesn't matter if they're just going to basically go through the motions anyway and use the timeout for next round. Um, that's perfectly acceptable, and that's what they're doing. Destiny 
uh, picking up the first call into Urkas, but once again, there's such limited resource for the terrorists, they don't expect to win this. I might actually throw out there a, a, a different opinion. I actually rate the tech pause, as we see Drat there, picking off an overly aggressive destiny. I rate the tech pause before an eco, in the sense that if you're changing things up dramatically, it almost gives the players on your team an extra round just to throw any clarifying questions out there, make sure everyone's on the same page, make sure they know exactly what they're doing, particularly if it's something that they haven't had as much time to practice in the past. Yep. No, that's that's definitely a fair point. I just think that with the changes that they're looking at making, as Alistair picks up Mungo, so we'll just concentrate on this round for just a second because it's a four versus three in favour of Corviday, and uh, they've got two M4s in their hands, so this is not without its problems here for Chiefs. There's also armour on one of the players who has an M4 in the form of Alistair, so very, very difficult round here for Chiefs to pull away from. Chriso, Byrne, and Dexter still all on full HP. I mean, uh, Dexter's on 99, which is close enough, and he won't actually connect, and Inns will time that one to perfection, jumping out of Vines, and once again, Corvidae look good on the back of Attack Pause without any sort of resource at all. They've made some fantastic changes, and hopefully this will bode well for them, but uh, Byrne picks up one. The bomb, great call here from Corvidae, is moving towards inside and they will get this plant down and we'll try and force the CTs to retake. Burn goes down and now Chris O'Waz faced with a very difficult decision and it looks as though he's going to go for it. Maybe. Um, not, not, not a believer just yet. I think he's not actually just waiting. No. But let's not forget the way that this round actually unfolded because Corvidae, hats off some great job at manipulating their position on the map to manage to catch members of Chiefs off guard. But they were initially granted a gun or gifted a gun from Destiny pushing up SL. Now, we've been, I guess, applauding Destiny for his aggression so far. I think in this instance, whilst it has lost them around, I think you need to give as good as you take. I think you still have to acknowledge that that's what's been working up until this round. Yep. I'm not going to hold it against him. No way. And I just want to make everyone playing at home aware of that brilliant heads-up play that Chris O'Wall just did. He picked up an AWP, and he actually threw it up the sniper deck where no one was alive or died to hide that second AWP. Stage comes looking for that AWP. Chris actually hid one, picked up the other, and kept that one out of Gratisfaction's hands. And I think he may still have the money to buy one if they so choose. Urkast there. They don't, but it's still massive there for Chris, able to keep that AWP out of the hands of Corbett, eh? Yeah, big call. Heads up play. Heads yes. up play. Yes. That's just showing the game awareness of an experienced veteran. It is. Obviously, he won with Team Chiefs when they had the opportunity to qualify for IOM Type Haver. It couldn't go to due to passport issues, but yep. he's an experienced veteran of the game in our scene and showing why just then his rat does fall back from Tegon. Just has the M4, and like we said, we want him to have that AWP, but I guess the economy at this point has dictated that he will be using that M4 that he did salvage last round at the moment. Burn just holding inside, and I like the way they've taken control of Brown Halls on their default. This is what we wanted to see. Now, at the moment, Burn, the solo player, is still holding, but he's under so much more pressure knowing that the T's are so close to him and it's putting doubts in the mind of Chiefs. Do they need to send someone back to support him? Because if they don't, they run the risk of Corvidae executing onto B and overwhelming him. Yeah, but this is really interesting. I guess, why would it take attack pause to, to have to make this adjustment? Inexperience. 100%. Fair. 100% fair. That's that's a very fair point, and we are being over, like very very critical. Obviously, these guys are playing at a very high level, so we expect certain standards. But we do need to take into consideration this is their very first attempt at a national LAN event, and uh, they're coming up against some pretty experienced campaigners. And Gratis Faction will open the account for the round as 45 second mark reaches. It's uh, Pinnacle Dex there opening a uh, frag for Chiefs, but the trade game is working well. Alistair takes down Destiny, and now it's a four versus three in the favor of Corvidae, but they're not doing a lot, and the bomb's still down. 30 seconds to go, Nick. They're going to have to make a decision sooner or later as to what they want to do. Well, yeah, and at the moment, Chriso in that advanced position, not only will he get that frag, he actually hears the footsteps of that bomb member ultimately going towards Teton, so he knows that it's an outside attack. This is the first off, it spots out two members there, so at least Burn now has some information that he can use to his advantage, but great, oh, well, unfortunately, I was going to say great usage of utility, but the smoke and the Molotov cancelling each other out, nonetheless, the smoke's still there to block his view at this point as Steege goes up the sniper deck. Alistair, perhaps looking to play suit. Snakes and ladders here at this point. Yeah, they've... Uh Weasel their way both towards the same sort of area, but uh, Burn is going to know the position of at least one of these terrorists, which will actually bode well for the the terrorist Corvidae because I think Alistair's run away from that position, and it, you know Burn's going to have no idea that that second player is up sniper deck now, so it's going to be very very difficult to win. That is, oh my God, Steve is just launched off the balcony and just spectacularly difficult fashion and they're just giving it away oh my goodness can he do it he's gonna set the bomb the molotov what is going up. on can he get the defuse no oh, burn are you what okay are you burn are you okay there is many face palms there from the faces of corbett oh my goodness what is going on steve please explain to the people what you're doing Oh, what is that? I have no idea what the, that was distracting. A one versus three. That is inexplicable wow. there from Corvidae. They were that confident 
but that he wasn't actually going for the round because what he did was he actually didn't make a sound there as he waited in said connector. Yes, the smoke blocked his view, but he didn't give away his position. He didn't give away any sound cues. So Corvidae, not recognizing it, was actually going through that difficult situation. And Dexter converting there, but ultimately Corvidae face palming and losing rounds that they shouldn't. Yeah, this is going to be very difficult for them because that is emotionally a very, very difficult round to stomach. But Alistair isn't uh, particularly concerned with that as he rips the face off. Dexter, he's not going to put that off to good use, but luckily for Chiefs, there's a second AWP in play, which is in the hands of Burn. Are you okay? The hero from last round, miraculous 3v1 defuse, but as it stands, Mungo will just have that shotgun, and it is going to be a four versus three, but greatest faction on just four points of health. So pretty much, um, my apologies, it's a four versus four, but yeah. greatest faction on just four points of health. So it's going to be difficult here for Corvidae to... Uh, really do anything. I like this position from Mungo actually. Has the shotgun. Might not need it in the sense that Burns already found that nice headshot there onto Gratis Faction, but that close quarters carried in as it's sometimes referred given the I guess the proclivity which he used to play under the TSM tag and you can see why as he goes up the ladder, the shotgun pellets connecting there with Alistair. He falls and ultimately Corvidae now almost wasting a lot of time trying to take it down and it allows the other Chiefs members to rotate. It's now a 3 versus 2 all upon this A bomb slide. So Chiefs have the man advantage and Siege, he's still looking for that frag and Mungo, he's not giving to his found his second destiny gets the last. And Chiefs, this is quickly becoming a play mode. Yeah, and interestingly enough, I know that uh, Burn had that AWP in hand and he managed to hit a cracking shot there to really put that one beyond doubt for Chiefs. But when he was in Trident, before he got picked up into, like, I guess, the, the new Chiefs roster, yep. he, had, he was the secondary orbit for that team and he had a lot of good looks with the AWP, so he's very well versed in it, even though he hasn't used it a lot recently. He's been utilised as an entry frag with a rifle. Yeah, I think so. I think he was just probably one of the most talented players on the roster, but when time came, he could use that gun adequately, but nonetheless, Corvidae, this last A execute, it's worked well for them initially, they have found two frags here, get a third, there's the performance rat, and all of a sudden, it is just Mungo, the last man standing, has an AK this time, not the shotgun, perhaps should have kept that shotgun, does fall ultimately Alistair, and Corvidae trying to inspire themselves at the moment, I think that's what that jeering is, it's more them trying to inspire themselves as opposed to getting in the heads of Chiefs. Yeah, but once again, Corvidae making a very crucial adjustment, they're changing the pace up and getting out midcon very quickly with those rifles, and uh, they have now forced Chiefs onto an eco, so really good work, even though Chiefs won a lot of those clutch rounds, they were so close in the end that now, obviously, Chiefs can't afford to buy into this one, and they'll take their 9-2 lead and basically just have to sit on it for a while. They've left the B-bomb side completely unattended, which is fine given the circumstances. They took a gamble on outside, it hasn't paid off, and this should be a free round for Corvidae, which it certainly appears to be, as uh, there's nothing there for Dexter apart from a Tech-9, which is, uh, you know, a very okay situation. And it's hilarious to me, actually, that the downfall for Dexter in the instance was that this place smoke for Corvidae. Actually, as they were running down that B-bomb site, the smoke bounced off the wall, bounced backwards. It was meant to cover low ramp. In the end, it blocked the vision of the terrorist before old Dexter. Yeah. Affected him later on, but nonetheless, always going to go that way. But you can see the money here for Chiefs, but this is really important for me. Like you said, for all those reasons, the fact that the previous rounds had been close, Chiefs on a double eco here. They're investing in some light pistols, but at the moment, it's just allowing Corvette to claw their way back in. We saw this on case. You can't allow these guys to get that momentum. They're a momentum-based team. Yep. And at the moment, they're moving very quickly these last few rounds, and the rounds are going by so quickly that the deficit is closing before Chiefs really can comprehend what's happening. Yeah, Destiny will push up the ladder there, and I don't think he'll be spotted out. This is going to be absolute tears for one of the Corvidae players who's up the ladder, but he does, Urkast does turn around and get a double there onto the two Ds from Chiefs, Destiny, and Dexter. So, once again, just an eco round here for Corvidae cleaning house, and that's bode well for them because they'll pick up their fourth round, uh, presuming nothing goes completely awry, which we have seen a few I'm not times. Really <laughs> not really yet, anything mate. out, but certainly Corvidae in the box seat to pick up their fourth round. And Chiefs really need to nail the last few rounds of this uh, half and get themselves... In. If they get 10 or more, that visual uh, visual prompt of seeing a double-digit scoreline on, on the advantage half will be crucial for Chiefs' confidence, and they'll be able to... Well, they should be able to get at least 60 rounds, you should think. So I'm, I'm gunning for 10 for Chiefs, but Corvidae here in a good position to get that 9-6 and really put the pressure on. Yeah, crystal nice frag there. Alistair actually, and Burns finding one as well. So they're actually doing a good job on these E2 rounds of making it, I guess, I guess a heavy investment for Team Corvidae. They're not giving him any easy frags. They're still putting the pressure on them, which is what we wanted to see. At the moment, it is 9-4 that we spoke of. And you can see already that AWP getting put into Dexter's hands. I think they actually just juggled the guns. Dexter bought an M4, but didn't quite have, I guess, the economy to be up for the AWP. So they've made sure that they've got that in his hands. 
IGL or Orpa, clutch player, a lot of responsibility on Dexter, but we'll see what he can do on track. Yeah, and uh, luckily for him, Destiny's been an absolute machine, as has Chris O'Wow all, all series long and uh, all of yesterday. So he's lent pretty heavily on those guys, which is, you know, the whole point of them being in the team is that he can direct traffic and get them in good positions. And he's dispersed his uh, troops halfway along the map, just setting up that great wall of defense. And Quarter, they committed early to this straight. Yes, Chris hasn't been hurt, but crucially, he heard all three HG nades. Now, on a map like Train, knowing that there's three members at Vines, that's such an indicator that Terrace will commit to that A bomb side because the rotation time is so long otherwise. But Corbett, Despite giving off that information, they're making the frags work. They found one, they found two. Alistair coming out of SL. It's worked out well for them. The pins are perfect. It's Chiefs who are ultimately suffering at the hands of Corvade in this round. But uh, Dex has picked up a great kill there, and uh, the bomb will go down, and Chris is still alive. Urkast will take out Dexter, and now it's a two versus one for the Iceman, Chris Wow, in a clutch situation. But he's only on 15 points of health, which is a massive, massive difference, and he'll get sacked by Gratis Faction, so Bruin closed the round, and one can only imagine what had have happened if Burn hadn't have won that close three versus one, because yeah. this would be a whole different game here for Chiefs. Something I will point out for all the people playing at home as well is that we actually saw with that triple vine set up from Corvidae. All three members HG the right hand side of vines. Now, from our work previously, uh, I think the stat goes that about 85%, 85 to 90% of times people playing vines, they play from the outside side of the bomb side. So they had that conscious decision to nade that side of the vines. It worked out well. Corvidae now moving very quickly towards this B bomb side. Yeah, and there's not going to be a lot of utility there for Chiefs, but Burn will pick up one. Can he pick up two? He takes his time but doesn't get the shot, so he'll uh, he'll pay dearly for that one. But Chris O'Wow has managed to pick up this scout, so it'll still be put to good use. And he spotted one out as Mungo gets flame grenaded away. And I think this has actually been a, a, a moderate investment here for Chiefs, which does does surprise me. Well, it shouldn't surprise me given it's the last round of the half, and they've bought what they can. So Gratis Faction there rolling into the bomb site is now a three versus two for the last round of the half and as I said Chiefs will really want this 10-5 score line but uh, Corvidae doing everything within their power to stop them from doing that now Dexter is in a two versus one he will go down you can hear the crowd pumping up on behalf of Corvidae here we go the murderous crows are circling Nick and they're on their way back my only reservation and I will end the excitement just there is because my biggest fear for them is they run out of gas can they keep this going and long enough to finish the map off I've worked out the key from a Corvidae perspective. From What's now the on. key? Take tactical pauses after you've lost one round. Because your ability to make adjustments that's, that's is incredible. That's very true. If you lose pistol, just take attack pause. Exactly. And you'll be immediately bouncing back to because, win the next round. Because all jokes aside, they've shown that fantastic ability to make those adjustments. They were down 8-1 or 9-1. They finished 9-6 at the moment. Corvidae on the CT side and Chiefs heading or at least sending three members early towards the inside. But I'm curious as to what Dexter and Chris are up to. They're spawning the time towards Vines at the moment. Stage will spot a few members out and perhaps communicate that as it has forced that rotation as I do believe Brannis Faction is now. No, I do apologise. Alistair swinging back in. But this is something that Chiefs do like to do. Get the bomb spotted in a certain area and then pull it back. So it gives the impression that the bomb's going to be uh, in that area as Chris O'Wow and uh, his teammate there, Dexter, try and get the opening pick onto Inz at Vines. But Inz is going to spot one out and do a bit of damage, so not a lot of action being seen by anyone in, in the server, really. Just a couple of bullets being fired here and there, and that smoke has come down on low ramp, but it looks as though Chiefs are going to come to split this outside bomb site, and there are so many players rotating towards inside. They've made an incorrect read here, Corvidae. They've gambled on the inside bomb site. You can see almost every player, Urkast at least, is now making his way back outside, so into that mid-con area, but Gratis Faction needs to go absolutely mental here to uh, to put Corvidae in a winning position as the Terrace flow out from the uh, T-Connector in the SL room. It will be Urkast opening up before Destiny trades back now. Uh, it will be Gratis picking up one as well. Inns knows there's a kill at his disposal, but Destiny and Chriso pick up the one and two punch, and now it's a two versus three for the pistol round. It will be Steej getting one and the bomb down. This is absolutely a hectic round, Steej. We'll spot one out and hit the headshot. It is now a one versus one. Steve already with two. Dexter! Oh! I thought it was Steve. I thought he'd done enough. I thought that he'd managed to nail the kill. But the in-game leader for Chiefs settles everyone down by reminding people before he was an in-game leader, he was actually a star fragger. The power comes through there. Dexter picks up the kill and what a round to win for Chiefs. Yeah, I think Steve's there looking for redemption off the back of that one versus three in the previous instance where he jumped out of the sniper deck in that time or in this instance. Not able to make that frag. It looked as though he would have the drop, but greatest faction with that deal. Again, a heavy investment from a player that we'd like to see getting that AWP early. Perhaps like to see him eco. That's what he But he got a dig one beyond land. Who cares? <laughs> yeah, fair call. Deagle headshots are king. And he gets one, but Mungo will take it. You down. would say that. I would, of course, say that.
Deagle is Deagle is the best, and the headshots look the best. They sound the best. They are the best. Well, nice work, Gratisfaction. If Corvidae lose because Gratisfaction can't afford an AWP, Deagle's still the best. Okay, Deagle's still the best. All right, but cool. Back in context here, uh, one apiece in terms of frags. Uh, Urkast with that scout has been tagged down pretty low, but. Just uh, Chiefs giving nothing away here. They don't want to push the pace and run into these pistols. They want to go together as a team and use those uh, utilities to good effect. Yeah, Destiny, he was spotted oh! out there. It does hit the, the fall away frag, but what he's doing at the moment is he's putting pressure on this outside bomb site. So, Gratisfaction at the moment is just feeding his information that they must be going outside because he's got members in his face, but we can see the bomb. It's snuck inside, and there's absolutely no CTs there, purely as a result of the work that Destiny did that round. Great work. Looking for perhaps another two frags just to justify his cause, but as he blinds one. Makes it look easy. Good work there yesterday. Yeah, Mark is uh, playing at a phenomenal level right now. And I, I don't just think it's his aim. His his cockiness has always been one of his best, you know, best attributes as a player. But at the moment, he looks like he's on a completely different stratosphere of confidence to everyone else in the server. He literally thinks anything that he does will come off and pay off for him. And it definitely has. He was the controlling force behind the, uh, the first victory on Cash, and he's done fantastic work here. Chiefs go up 11 to 6, and there'll be one more eco ensuing here for Corvidae before they'll be able to buy into that one. Steej will have enough to buy an AWP next round, as long as he doesn't commit to anything here, although he does buy he does. a P250, which is so disappointing, because now they're going to struggle to buy that AWP for gratisfaction. Which is a shame, because you shouldn't do that. That's a good thing, as we will learn. But nonetheless, Corvidae, it's actually stacking all five members towards the outside bomb, so going very aggressive, but... Not so much avail here as we see Chiefs actually moving towards B, and the only thing that can go right for Corvette in this instance is that they push that aggressively today, that they very quickly get the read that Chiefs are going to do. They should have that information by now with two members pushing vines, but strangely, there's still three members committing to the A bomb site. the other How three of Corvette. That makes no sense. This makes no sense. There's two players literally in T-spawn, clearing out T-con, going behind them, and there's still players outside at A. What are you doing, Corvette? There's nobody there, boys. Rotate inside. Well, they're doing Come it on, now. You've done all the hard late. work. You've done all the hard work. Doesn't make any sense. Obviously, we have the ad advantage of the overlay. Goes without saying, but you're sitting next to each other. You can look at each other's monitors. But, but the whole point of pushing and getting that advantage is so you can make the rotation. Exactly. They did the hard part, which was the push, but then didn't make the rotation. Now, and Chiefs get that free bomb site inside. The bomb goes down, and uh, this will be a pretty easy shutout here for Chiefs. They'll pick up their twelfth round. Uh, barring something horrific here, which uh, shouldn't happen because Ince should be very much interested in keeping this AK versus trying to get this defuse, and he will back away with his teammate, uh, saving that AK-47. They'll go into the uh, next round with that at their disposal, uh, and which might actually help in the fact that now Ince can drop the gun and buy an AWP. Alternatively, because we look at Ince's money at the moment, he will have 4.7k. Unfortunately, 50 bucks 50 short. Short. What I would suggest, though, a heads-up play here. I'd suggest if Corvette can't afford an all, which they can now. The other alternative is give Gratis Faction the AK so he doesn't have to invest as much this round so that later on down the track he's more easily able to afford an AWP. Yeah, but there's no time. You can't just give away these rounds. You need to get the AWP in his hands ASAP. Fair and I'm cool. so glad that they have Gratis picking up that AWP and he needs to really put it to good use here. No AWP on the side for Chiefs. And in fact, Destiny is with that Galil in hand, which I'm not a huge fan of. Surely someone else could have taken, like Dexter, for example, takes that Galil off Destiny and gives him an AK. But now the Vines Beast will come out here as... Uh, the Chris O'Wow boost will come in and Inns will spot that one out and take down Dexter. Yeah, he heard the footsteps there. Unfortunately for Dexter, he jumped and wasn't able to get up to the head of his teammate the first go round. So Inns heard that, had the game of sense to look up at that box, picked him off. Great opening frag there. And it's dismantled that Vines attack. It's now allowing Corvidae to perhaps redistribute the forces across the map as that rotation comes inside, which is where Chiefs are headed. Yeah, but that pick means that Chriso has taken down the AWP of Gratis Faction and now there's no ability for Corvidae to have any idea that Chiefs are about to come through this inside part of the map. And uh, number... I think that uh, Corvidae are going to get the read here as Alistair pushes through T-Connector and sort of boxes Crystal out, but they're going to get the read, but it won't matter. Mungo picks up Steege. They're unable to nail that frag, and now it's a four versus three. Urkast needs to go absolutely bonkers here, pushing up the oil train. Alistair gets a kill through the smoke, so that'll start. Inns gets one as well. Urkast spots out Destiny, walking the wrong way, so he'll pick one up here, and it'll all be left on Chriso. Two versus one. I mean, please, anyone but Chriso here for Corvidae, and... He'll make his way down low ramp. I think the uh, Corvette players should have a pretty good idea, but he will get his spam. If he, oh. he will go down, although the TK has come in. There should be still be enough time. There definitely is enough time. Chriso almost pulling a rabbit out of the hat, but 
the money situation for Corvette is completely, completely dire. Because you did point out, Chiefs didn't have any AWPs. So in that instance, Urkast did. There was no opportunity for him to salvage that orb. Gratisfaction had died outside. So after he defused there, had to make deal with that AK. Gratisfaction not going to be able to afford an AWP. Curious to see what they make do with. That's almost like worst case scenario for Corbett where you win but only have one member survive here. Chiefs can easily afford to buy. If they could win this round, it'd be a hard reset for Corbett A's Zerkas. Very quickly, just trying to shut down that A execute, but it's happening here. They're rushing outside. Yeah, Chiefs turning the outside bomb site into a lottery. Those smokes and flashes will rain out. Everyone just uh, trying to share the battle of vision, seeing who will see who first. And it'll be Chiefs coming out in the exchange on top. Inz and uh, Granis Faction there going down to a double from Mungo. So he's put in some serious work. Destiny once again swindling through the smoke, and he's picked up. Alistair in his crosshair, but uh, Alistair doing a great job of picking up a double hand the bomb. Alistair, what a piece of aim there. And now Steve chips in as well, and uh, he'll pick up a double. That was a, a round momentum turning round there for Corviday. I was about to say, that's pretty. this is pretty much game. This is pretty much on the line because they were double eco and Chiefs were on 13. So that was such a crucial round for Corviday. And once again, even though sometimes they look a little bit rattled, the fight is there, the drive is there, and... Uh, they're definitely fighting for every single round of this match. They are. And it's great to see. It's, it's great, great to, to hear. See. At the moment, this round, in theory, should be a little bit easier for them in the sense that Chiefs only have invested in some pistols. One flash in the hands of Dexter. And he was thinking about throwing towards Brown Halls if that information from Chriso had indicated that there was a member of the defense there. But that's not to be. We can see Corvidae holding a much more passive setup. Actually have nearly three members committed to inside at this point. So... They've shown that tendency to almost gamble on their CT side setups and rotate very freely between sites. That can be a good thing. It can also be a not so good thing at this point. As it is, Urkast can hear those footsteps above SL. Has the SMG. He's keeping the distance close so he can hopefully try and maximize kills with that money earner. Yeah, no flash and no smoke here for Chiefs. So they're just going to have to go into a bomb site just almost completely without any sort of assistance. It's Steege spotting a player out of Tom Ram and he'll get that call for a rotator to come in. But uh, it looks as though Inz has already found his way into mid corner. Urkar's spotting out the uh, the tippy toes there of Destiny as he, he tries to get down the ladder but will eventually go back up and Urkar's has got the great angle there. But Dex has managed to get his way out of T-Con and sandwich this one. But Alistair comes up with a crucial kill here. Gratis Faction able to lay waste to at least one person in the ladder room and uh, now they'll fall back Chiefs pretty much with no option left over. And uh, when it looked serious, Corvette were able to get themselves back in control of the round. Yeah, not only did he take down Mungo, he actually spotted out Chiso as well. So the information as to the whereabouts of both remaining Chiefs members was there for Corvette. And you can see Ince there with some much needed frags. Didn't have the best first half, but starting to get his groove on in the second half. He's finding his mojo, and again, the same story as Casey with Corvette closing the gap. It's 12 9 at the moment. We saw that Chiefs had the experience and the composure on the first map to close that out when things got tight. We'll see how well they vote at the moment. Dexter does have that AWP. Grant has it. Crucially, he has a lot of utility to support his cause at the moment. And Dexter looking for the early exchange. You're actually getting out into Nook. T Cutter, as he's otherwise known, but a very aggressive stance and a double pick from Corvade proved to be his downfall. Yeah, and uh, I'll just take this little opportunity before Chiefs move towards the top side to really give Alistair a pat on the back for his performance so far. He uh, he struggled very, very early on in Cache, but since then he's managed to turn it around in his first Nationals, and I think he's only 15 or 16 years old. I think he's very, very young at this point. They're all young. Uh, they're all very young, so it's just a fantastic display here of uh, concentration and patience from Alistair, and now Steve will find one, and he will turn take down Burn. Are you okay? And now push with the smoke. Brilliant actual heads up play there by Steve. But he's unable to connect with that frag. And now it's a three versus three, Nick. Yeah, the bomb, it should get planted momentarily. Alistair actually spots him out and ints there. We spoke about him coming alive. Well, he's found Mungo. Urkast moves in, takes down Destiny. The bomb plunge, and they know the whereabouts of Chriso. But Pete, another one versus two. It's been time and time again, but the smoke, it obscures his vision, but they don't know his whereabouts just yet. You can see they fake the bomb. There at the moment, they're just covering low ramp and high ramp respectively. But it's happening again, Chriso. He stepped down, he's got the frag. He's managed to get back in high ramp, and this is absolute gold for him at the moment. And Ince is left in a position where he wants to defuse. He throws the flash up, the smoke is down. Chriso, he cuts it. The defuse is coming in. He gets it. He gets away alive. And the fail shank signals the end of that round for Chiefs Hogs. That is a momentum game changer there for Corvida. You can hear the crowd erupting. They're such a momentum team. Alistair's dropping 20 on them at the moment. Steege is on 18. And I must say, he had a horrible game on Cache, and he had a horrible start to this match. He made some really big errors I thought would cost him. He's managed to pull himself out of the abyss, so to speak, and get himself back in the game, competing in a very, very high level. So well done to, uh, 
to Stage there for turning his game around and Corvidae just there's no quit in them Nick there's just so much fight and passion in this Corvidae team it's it's electrifying it's contagious the crowd here are feeding off there and uh, their organization's energy which is just a brilliant sight to see I absolutely love it now again Chiefs falling back into this default here with a sending two members Vines last time we saw that both Dexter and I do believe it was Chris are actually opted to go for that double boost trying to get one member on top of the box but it was instant heard the footsteps caught them off guard we'll see how well it pans out this time there's some early investment there from a few grenades coming out from Corvide and at the moment, as it stands, they've really only got, I think, a couple of smoke grenades and one Molotov to support them for the next minute. So Chiefs doing a great job at getting Corvidae to expend those nades. This is uh, one of those rounds where you think to yourself, Corvidae have every reason to win it, but can they win it? Can they get the, capitalize on their momentum and stop Chiefs from getting themselves back into the game? Because Dex is going to push out Vines, the end game leader, picking up ins, and now the uh, the Chiefs roster will actually just hold back and, uh, interestingly enough, move towards inside. So uh, it will be a very, very shady situation here for Alistair, but he's got a great spot. Look at Alistair holding the patience. He will get the first. Can he get the second? He doesn't. Burn able to trade out. Now it's a two versus three, but crucially, Chiefs will get the bomb plan, and uh, Corvidae will try and retake this one as uh, Burn actually picks up another one. This is brilliant play, but Steej has found a kill. Now Destiny, two versus one. 30 HP. What can he do? He picks up one. Can he pick He does! Destiny! Mark Destiny Kagan, and he doesn't even flinch, ladies and gentlemen. He showed no emotion. The lifeless eyes of Destiny stare into the void of his monitor, and he says, that is easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Well, Pete, he didn't show any emotion, but I can tell you who did. The five members of Call Day, their heads have sunk. They're asking themselves, how on earth did we let that one slide? They knew his whereabouts. He obviously fired initially at one member there, and it's forced Call Day to a situation where they've just shot the pistol armor. Yes, they have some grenades, but that was their round. That was the two versus one. They had him trapped inside that bomb site, but sometimes you can't stop the magic in Destiny. Working all angles there. And uh, Chiefs here. This is this round for Corvidae is really where you see the inexperience show through. They've won a really big round. They've lost a clutch, and now they've just thrown three people away straight away. They've not really. I didn't see a pop flash to try and push. I didn't see any meaningful teamwork. I'm not saying the aggressive strat was bad, but there was no teamwork involved. They just sort of all ran their separate ways and died. And for me, that shows a real lack of uh, real lack of foresight for them. And now they're put in a very bad situation to try and hold on to this game with their money. Well, that's right. I think even as a result of that investment in the last round, it wasn't yeah. just the direction of investing. It now leaves greatest faction in a situation where all you can afford literally is a scout. No armor, no utility, no sort of sense of better weaponry. And Corvidae, they must win this round to really keep their hopes alive because otherwise their economy would be broken for the 15th or when Chiefs are on 15. Yeah, this this was always my biggest fear. I kept saying it. How much gas has Corvidae got in the tank? How much fight is in there? Because they're sort of outwilling their opponents right now. It seems that they want it more than Chiefs, but they just can't get the rounds they need. They're just being let down a little bit by their gameplay, even though they're right in this. And look at the push here from Corvidae. They're so aggressive. And uh, they're just trying to find the first kill of the round to put themselves in a decent position to move forward. But Gratisfaction oh. has just shot Alistair oh. in the head. No. What happened? In the biggest round of the game, Gratis Faction's just shot his teammate in the okay, head. Okay, so he's obviously on tilt right now. It's important for Corvidae that they remain calm. This is still not out of control. Obviously, that doesn't help. It goes without saying, but Gratis Faction, he's their star player. He can't let it get to him at the moment. At least he one beat him. Wait, he's him. sharp. He's very, very sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, Chiefs here. I think appreciating the efforts of Gratis Faction. They just line up these smokes. You can see actually four members at T-Dawn. They've been practicing this for quite some time. This is the tea party right here. Look at this. Three, four, five smokes come over the roof. Urkast will be close, but he won't get away in time. This is danger signs. Chiefs looking towards game point here, Nick. Destiny spots one out. He'll come that to his teammates, and Gratis Faction will, uh, will not pick up an enemy uh, frag for the round, and uh, Inns will... Now swindle in the smoke. Steej with that rifle in hand, but look, the situation is so dire. He goes down to a Molotov and uh, a bit of help there from Chris O'Wan. It's just Inns left over, and uh, Corvidae are watching this slip through their fingers as they, you know, put in all the good work and uh, can't get this one done. The worst thing as well is Inns looking to salvage something out of this round. It's not to be hard to save, but Alistair, who got killed by Gratis Faction, he actually had the most expensive weaponry. He, he had the M4A4. He was in such an advanced position. He was the man in that round that needed to go huge. Dexter was actually um, holding Teton, but quite passively. It had to be Alistair. Unfortunately, Gratis Faction didn't let that occur. Yeah, look, at, the, at this point, you really feel for Corvidae because um, they did all the hard work yesterday in trying to not have to play Chiefs, and then Chiefs didn't play the way that they're playing right now yesterday, which is two different rosters that uh, have turned up. So Corvidae, 
now a struggle street here. They're on the full buy, and they've got Vines control, which is really good. They've pushed out all the way, and they've cleared that area, but with such a deficiency in the weaponry available to them, this is going to be a very, very hard task for them to pull off, and they're going to have to make some magic happen. Well, Chiefs are in no rush. I like this problem. It's the moment they're just playing the patient game. This is what worked for them last round, and they actually managed to find a cheap kill in the form of Alistair, so not that they actually got the kill, but nonetheless, Chiefs at the moment, just biding their time. You can see Mungo has taken control of Brown Halls. As it looks as though Urkast is being a little bit inquisitive, trying to push up the ramp, but for the time being, no one actually committing to anything from Chiefs. It's another minute on the clock, so it's no rush. Heading towards this big site now, and from a Corvado perspective, they're very deep in the site. So as they come down these pistols, the long range is going to be a disadvantage for them. Steej here, he really needs to step up because he's the closest, and also, he's nearly the sole man in there. Yeah, he's going to have to go absolutely bonkers here to help Corvado out and get them across the line. But the smokes and flashes rain down on this inside bombsite. Burnering leads the charge in, and uh, the rotation's going to come in, but it will be too little too late. Burn takes down Steej, and that bombsite it was crucial. Urkast gets one, but he'll be traded out. Burn pushes through the train yard, try and get that advantage, but Inz has actually been able to make a play here through the smoke, so this will be interesting. Three versus three left over. These AKs are being put to such good use here. The advantage just too great for Chiefs, and they will take it out. Destiny finishing as he started. Uh, absolutely nailing his opposition. What a performance from Chiefs, but to be honest, Nick, my heart goes out to Corvette there. They've done such great work at this national event. They've put themselves in a position to win yesterday by doing all of the hard work, yes. trying to avoid playing this exact team. They wanted to get to the grand final and have to play them. It's not worked out for them, but uh, they should really, really be happy with the way they played. Uh, they should be f fully confident, ready and raring to come back next time and compete for the top title. Yes. But they've definitely proven that they're right there in terms of the quality of their roster, their application to the game, their mental fortitude. They just need that experience to catch up and then uh, they're going to be a serious threat moving forward. But hats off to Corvidae, but ultimately Chiefs, a little bit too strong. A little bit too strong. I think ultimately destiny. I mean, you can't stop him when he's what on a that monster. sort of, that what sort an of confidence, monster. that sort of swagger about him. Yeah. I loved those things when you took the time there to, I guess, acknowledge what Corvette have achieved this weekend because yep. they came in with a lot of doubters. This is their first land together. Yep. I actually really love the way they were able to make those adjustments mid-game for them. That's yep. a massive positive to take yep. away. A few things to think about, obviously, but for Chiefs now, box ticked. They can now have that opportunity to go away, get some lunch, yep. take that time now. They have the opportunity, should they choose, to sit back and watch the next semi-final to see who they'll be playing. Alternatively, yep. they might like to perhaps distance themselves, get away from the arena and just hear the results later on. No doubt they're the most prepared team here, as you've already indicated. So I think yep. that they'll be well-versed to play either Legacy or Alpha Sydney in the yep. grand final. Um, but fantastic match. Great way to start the day. And I just want to say one more point towards Corvidae because I think they played a smashing tournament and they should be very, very proud of what they accomplished. But 